without further ado, I would now like to invite Karsten onto the stage, uh, and I thank you all for your attention. Thanks, and, uh, and thanks for, for showing up, and thanks a lot for the invitation to, uh, to speak here about the, uh, the Danish, some of the Danish reform uh, experiences, and focusing particularly on, on the issues of, uh, of uh, capital investments and, and restructuring the hospital sector, and also looking a bit at the issue of uh, human resources. So I got a, a long kind of wish list of, uh, of topics uh, that I was supposed to be including, uh, and that means uh, I really have a lot of points to, to try to cover, but I think we can manage in, in half an hour, and uh, if not, we can uh, do the rest in the break and the uh, and panel discussion uh, afterwards. So I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the structural reforms uh, that have been taking place in Denmark. Um, as you may know, in 2007, we uh, implemented a structural reform that introduced regions or that amalgamated the previous uh, entities into larger regions. Uh, so in that sense, it's a bit similar to the process that, that you're going through in, in Ireland. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit about the policy process of the 2007 reform <coughs> and uh, also the policy objectives of the reform, and then uh, what has happened afterwards and subsequently, particularly in terms of uh, the hospital structure and uh, some of the other policy developments uh, going on. Then uh, a bit about current reform issues and, uh, and some key points uh, towards the end. And, and of course, one of the uh, topics uh, which uh, was, was uh, supposed to be covered is uh, the role of research. So I'm going to put that in uh, as I go along and, and try to highlight where uh, there's been interaction between the uh, administration and the political side and the research uh, side uh, for these efforts to, uh, to reform the Danish healthcare sector. Denmark, of course, is, uh, not, uh, uh, is quite similar to Ireland in, in terms of size and also in terms of population. We're about six million people. Uh, I think you're about five, so, so not, not that big a, a difference. Um, also, you know, like small country on the outskirts of, uh, of the rest of, of Europe, so, so not, not that uh, different there. Um, that also means that in terms of, of sort of the ge uh, geography of things, it, it's quite relatable. So, so the uh, geographical size is also similar and a lot of sort of coastal areas and, uh, and uh, islands and so on to, to deal with. Um, but speaking on, on the structural reforms in Denmark, so, so the first step at this really was in uh, way back in 1970 to 74, uh, which we called the municipal reform. And that established a structure with uh, 14 counties being responsible for, for health care. So being uh, responsible for hospitals and uh, general practitioners and so on. And then um, 275 municipalities with a broad range of tasks within the welfare state area. So dealing with elderly care, social care, and many of, of those issues. Then as time passed on, there was a realization that uh, maybe some of these municipalities were too small to handle uh, the increasing uh, pressure, particularly in terms of like specialized social care and, and handicapped uh, people and so on. Uh, they, it became a burden both in terms of the, uh, the capacity, uh, uh, the professional capacity and also economically. So that gave rise to a lot of discussions about maybe doing uh, an additional structural reform and that culminated in 2005, where the uh, political talks about a new reform were, were initiated. And what uh, ended up happening was um, a decision to amalgamate uh, the previous 13 counties into five larger regions of about a million in size, uh, about a million population in size, uh, the capital area being bigger and the northern Jutland being smaller. And then 98 uh, municipalities uh, with an average of about 50,000 uh, population. And uh, the structure from 2007 going forward then is that the regions maintain the responsibility for specialized uh, care. Also, they uh, interact with the private GPs. So, so uh, the GPs operate under a national level contract and, and uh, deliver services and are paid mostly from the public purse. Um, and then uh, municipalities take on the, uh, <coughs> the role of, uh, of the more sort of preventive care and home-based care, uh, elderly care. So, so all of the things that are proximate to the population in, in that sense. 
There are political uh, councils in both regions and municipalities, uh, but importantly, the regions lose their right to levy taxes. So that means that uh, some of the autonomy and some of the power base of the regions is removed. Uh, so so it's, it's one step towards uh, a tighter control from the, uh, from the national uh, level. Um, they become funded by block grants from the state. Uh, and then uh, also the introduction of a new uh, financing instrument, which is uh, co-financing from the municipal side. And the idea here is that the municipalities should have incentives to keep people out of hospitals, basically. Uh, that means stepping up their preventive services and providing sort of intermediary services to, to uh, avoid hospitalization when it's not really necessary. Um, in addition to the uh, to the block grants, there's uh, uh, an incentive-based schemes for the for the for the uh, regions, which is which was initially based on activity uh, purely, uh, but uh, subsequently has been refined to to a, a broader set of performance criteria. And I'll get back to that in in a minute. So, so municipalities responsible for a broad range of these welfare services, and the idea is that if you collect a lot of those services at the same authority, then you have. Uh, good possibilities for delivering sort of a, a well-rounded uh, set of care. Of course, that, <laughs> that creates a new sort of issue of how to integrate with the regions. And a lot of the work that has been going on since 2007 is about the integration across those administrative uh, lines. Schematically, it looks like this. Um, so we don't have to go through. Just one thing to note is that we have these uh, two organizations, the Danish regions and local government Denmark, that act sort of as interest organizations for the regions and the municipalities. And they also enter political agreements with the state level, and, and they are kind of intermediaries in binding together uh, a lot of the sort of policy coordination across the national level and the uh, regional and municipal uh, levels. So what enabled this structural reform? Uh, it, was, it has been labeled an unthinkable reform because uh, there was a lot of resistance and you can expect a lot of resistance when you go through. Uh, and indeed, uh, previous attempts had failed. Uh, so theoretically, you can, you can argue that risk aversity, status quo bias, and all of these issues uh, are at stake. But it's also mainly that, that people that are within the system, they, they of course, <laughs> feel it's, uh, it's risky to embark uh, on, on, uh, on reforms. So uncertainty among public employees, uh, resistance, of course, from the politicians at the local levels, because if they were to be amalgamated, they would have to join their neighbor municipalities, and they might lose their seats, and so on. So, so how did it happen anyway? Uh, well, uh, research has shown that uh, it was really sort of a combination, a perfect storm of a lot of uh, of unique circumstances at the particular point in, in time. And what were they? Well, you had uh, strong pro policy entrepreneurs within the uh, main government party. It was a coalition party with one main party and one smaller party. Uh, so you had policy entrepreneurs, uh, the later prime minister actually, uh, who was very, very much uh, engaged in this process and, and very good at sort of pushing it uh, through. So he was willing to invest political capital in this process. And then there was kind of a shift internally in uh, the main political party. So you could say where previously they had been very sort of focusing on local level democracy and sort of the rural uh, voice, uh, they became more interested in, in sort of welfare state reforms and centralism and so on. There was a strong support within government from the minor coalition party. Uh, they had had this issue on the agenda for a while, uh, but had not been able to gain traction. But now they sort of seized the opportunity. And similarly, there was a parliamentary situation with uh, a party outside uh, the government, which was kind of a, a, a stable uh, support for the government. And that really created a situation of a de facto majority, which is unusual in a, in a Danish case. But, uh, but it happened at the time. And, and that uh, really created a situation where it could be uh, pushed through. Then importantly, there was a kind of a coalition of external interest uh, organizations. And particularly, the uh, Danish industry uh, organization was, uh, was very interested in, in sort of pushing this through 
probably in order to, uh, to build larger entities for doing outsourcing and bidding and so on, so creating more leverage for, for market-type solutions. Uh, and they kind of joined forces with uh, local government Denmark, so the municipality association, uh, because the municipality saw that they would gain tasks and economy from the, uh, from the regional level. So in that sense, two quite powerful in, uh, interest organizations in Denmark supported uh, this, this reform. Um, and then uh, research has pointed out that the management of the policy process was really important as well. So that was kind of designing and steering the, uh, the uh, government committee or the administrative committee that was to do research on structural reform. Uh, so that, that's one of the linkages with the, with the academics and the research, uh, although um, it was quite, uh, quite tightly controlled from the, from the political side or from the uh, administrative side. So it became a bit difficult for, for research to, to enter, but th they were invited in uh, at least. Uh, so management of the process, designing and steering this investigation uh, committee, and then also the government sort of quite cleverly kept the opposition in, in, in kind of the dark in terms of their actual uh, purpose. So, so it became difficult to, to really um, mobilize uh, resistance. And then uh, another sort of trick in the process was to guarantee jobs for all public employees. Uh, so this uncertainty for people within the system was, uh, was dismantled in that same sense. So, so what ended up being the primary policy goals here for the reform? Uh, well, it was, um, See, the issue was that this uh, investigation committee, they weren't able to find sort of a clear burning platform for reform. So they had to build a different type of rhetoric. And the rhetoric they came up with was that this is to, to, uh, to prepare uh, for the long-term challenges that, that we're facing. And, and that, that's, of course, true. Uh, but, uh, but it wasn't really a, a sort of a momentary or, or a burning platform at the moment. So preparing for demographic, uh, demographic transition uh, and increasing demands for chronic and long-term care. Um, <clears throat> building sustainability and capacity at the municipal level. So this issue of, uh, of the professional capacity and the economic capacity at the municipalities, um, particularly within uh, social health and elderly care. Then also streamlining the public sector, uh, creating sort of easier entry points and, and more uh, easily understandable entry points for the population and eliminating some of the unclear responsibilities that are all inherent in, in these kinds of systems. So, so when are things health care, when are they social care, when are they elderly care, and so on. Um, it's also to improve uh, the state steering capacity. So there was frustration at the state level about not always uh, getting uh, or being able to implement the ideas that, they, that they'd come up with. So, so there are a lot of sort of levers and you can see also as we move on that, that more have been added to, to this uh, steering network over time. Um, and then to facilitate centralization of hospital infrastructure and that was really a key point. Uh, so making it possible to, to change uh, the, uh, the, the hospital, uh, physical hospital infrastructure and do uh, reorganizations uh, there. And um, uh, the idea uh, also to, to create these larger entities to promote market solutions. So, so how did research fit into this process? As I said, uh, it, it, was, it informed uh, this uh, structural investigation committee, uh, so they they looked for evidence uh, outside, and sometimes they solicited uh, small pieces of research. Uh, but it was, uh, as I said, also a, a quite tightly sort of administratively controlled uh, committee in the sense of, of sort of the workflow and, and so on. So, so in that sense, uh, yes, they used evidence from outside, but, it, but it, as always in these uh, situations, it's a matter of, of, uh, of sort of dance, doing the, the dance right between the, the political side and the academic side. So there were three external uh, experts uh, included uh, within the committee. One of them was an academic uh, a university person, and, and the three external uh, persons, they ended up uh, actually having a dissenting uh, voice in the end, so saying that, that they had been pushed too far in terms of, of the control of, of their conclusions. So, so that also sort of testifies to, to some of the, the issues that can sometimes uh, arise in, in these uh, interactions. So what have been developments since 2007, uh, and this is where we start to talk about the hospital infrastructure, and that has really been the, the major change. So 
centralization of the hospital structure, reorganization of emergency care was the key issue. So amalgamating into bigger units, uh, assembling uh, all of the, the important specialties around the acute care functions, uh, the new larger acute care functions. Um, and then, uh, of course, upscaling capacity in the municipalities, so building uh, better uh, municipal services, so establishing health centers or establishing uh, acute uh, care functions, not, not sort of uh, extensive acute care functions, but places where you could be, uh, if you're an elderly person that are suspected of, of, uh, of having to enter the hospital, then you can sort of be placed temporarily there, or after discharge, you can be placed in these uh, positions. And then the establishment of health clusters, uh, where the idea is to have a tighter co a collaboration between the hospitals, the GPs, and the municipalities in terms of coordinating the services and, and getting good agreements on, on who will do what and, and how to do it, how to pass information is, is a key issue here as well. Um, so a lot has happened on the on hospital side, and I'll get back to that a little bit more. But but just uh, just to also highlight that the changes have been ongoing in terms of how the steering between the different levels uh, take place. So so there's uh, there are developments in terms of the multi-level uh, governance in terms of of how the uh, the coordination the policy coordination takes place across the the levels. So so what we have in Denmark is. Uh, is uh, annual uh, economic agreements between the state and the municipalities and the regions. So this is really an occasion where they sit down and they discuss both the economic framework uh, and also new policy initiatives. So it's an important sort of coordination forum uh, for launching new, new, uh, new things. Um, the, uh, however, the the uh, the. Uh, from the state level, there's been a perception that that wasn't quite enough uh, for coordinating. So, so they introduced a, uh, a budget law uh, in 2012, uh, which uh, implied automatic sanctions if the uh, regions and municipalities go beyond their budgets. Uh, so that, that really is a quite a, a, a strong um, and more formalized uh, way of, of controlling what goes on at the regional and, and municipal levels. Um, so the way it works is if you exceed, then you're going to be, uh, then it's going to be subtracted from your, from your uh, block grant for the, for the uh, coming year. Um, another economic steering tool here was to <coughs> combine the block grant with uh, activity-based funding for parts of the funding, the state-level funding. And uh, part of that activity-based funding was to have a mandatory 2% increase in activity every year. So in order to get access to the activity funding pool, you would have to demonstrate that you had increased your uh, activity level. Uh, and you can do that in Denmark because we have this uh, extensive registry system and you have uh, GRG-based uh, accounts of, of what's going on. Uh, so you can track the rec record of, of activities. So, uh, so that, that worked quite well, actually, until 2019 uh, in terms of pushing up activity uh, and, and eliminating waiting lists, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, but it also, of course, has uh, a negative downside. So you start within the system to, to focus uh, too much, perhaps, on, on the activity and, and not really addressing other policy goals uh, sufficiently. So we'll get back to that. Um, then other uh, tools for the state, planning of uh, hospital specialties. Uh, so that was, uh, that's also a state uh, task. Um, monitoring of patient rights. And uh, the patient rights uh, include uh, cancer and heart packages with very short and very uh, sort of um, strict um, uh, timelines uh, for what goes on in, at, at different uh, steps along the way. And then also a... Uh, Diagnosis and treatment guarantee, uh, which uh, guarantees access to diagnosis within 30 days and then subsequently treatment within 30 days. Um, and the way it works is that um, the regions would have to pay for access to private facilities if they are not able to deliver on these uh, waiting time uh, limits. So that's also quite a strong sort of economic pressure on the, on the regions and on the hospital <coughs> system uh, in, in the, in the t uh, during that time. Uh, then introduction of medicines council and also a treatment council to do prioritization input from the national level. So this is another entry point for research, uh, so feeding into national prioritization boards, which is really is uh, here. 
Um, yeah, then I mentioned the, the municipal co-payment. Uh, and then, of course, digital infrastructure, uh, which is very extensive in, in the Danish case. Uh, and it, it's built on a long history of having uh, national uh, digital strategies and, and uh, quite an extensive uptake at the regional and municipal levels. So we do have electronic patient records. We have extensive... Uh, uh, national registries where you can track uh, developments uh, of health and, and uh, capacity and so on. Uh, and it's all linked together into a national health portal, uh, which you can enter both on the professional side and the patient side, so you can get access to your records uh, and so on. Uh, and it, of course, can also be used for performance monitoring and uh, quality frameworks and, and so on. So it has a lot of, of purposes and a lot of uh, different ways of, of being used. Um, all of this amounts to a type of, of centralization, a gradual centralization of the power uh, since 2007. So it is a multi-level governance structure. We still have autonomous regions and municipalities, and they still have a strong position, of course. But over time, sort of uh, the control from the uh, state level has been uh, tightened uh, somewhat. So, so in that sense, you could say the regions operate in kind of a the shadow of state interventions, and, and they're always uh, also threatened with being dismantled by renewed structural reforms. So, so you really have a lot of uh, sort of power to, to try to push them in the, in the right direction. Hospital structure, uh, centralization, as I said, was a, was a key uh, uh, objective of the reform. And what happened was that there was a major investment scheme introduced from 2009. Uh, with matched funding from the state, 60% and 40% from the, from the regions. Uh, and uh, getting access to the state funding was contingent upon uh, providing a hospital plan which was to live up to particular criteria that was set by a national level a committee. And those criteria included uh, the establishment of these new uh, what was called joint acute wards, uh, which are based on 2,000 to uh, 200,000 to 400,000 population. And the idea here is to collect uh, all of the major specialties around the acute uh, care centers uh, so that they are able to handle uh, all major issues. Um, and and uh, also another uh, sort of innovation here was to make sure that uh, the senior staff, so, so all of the uh, experts were uh, available, uh, readily available uh, within the joint acute wards. Um, so that was uh, built into these uh, 16 projects that were initiated uh, and, they, and the 16 projects include both sort of uh, all together new hospitals and, and also renewals of existing uh, hospitals. And they are uh, all projected to to uh, to end up saving four to eight percent of the uh, of the running costs. Uh, so it also means that you pull back some of the funding, uh, sort of upfront, uh, uh, trying to to uh, realize these uh, savings. So uh, what has happened is that 18 hospitals have been closed uh, around the the, uh, the country uh, since 2007, and others have been joined together under one management. Uh, so into 24 hospital organizations uh, based on, on uh, 54 different uh, sites. There was, as I said, a national level board that assessed the regional hospital plans and the uh, individual projects. And, and that was uh, a board which tried to, to sort of go through and find all of the evidence that was available in terms of uh, what's the optimal hospital size related to population size and so on. And of course, pulling on, on all of the st uh, statistical information that's available in, in the Danish case. So the status at this point is that 10 projects are complete and three are partially complete and three are ongoing. Um, and all projects are, are expected to be complete by 2026. Uh, uh, but it's not easy to do really major construction work. And particularly, it's not easy to do lots of it uh, at the same time, so in parallel. So, so that means that a lot of them have run into economic problems because uh, costs are higher when there's scarce uh, entrepreneurial capacity. Uh, so, so they're kind of competing for, for getting uh, people to do the job. Um, and, and also, uh, they've been plagued by construction flaws and so on. So the management of the process hasn't been uh, perfect. So, so that's, that's clearly a, a, an issue and a problem. Um, this uh, chart shows uh, this change in the, uh, in the hospital funding structure or the funding structure for the, for the regions. And as I said, <coughs> from uh, 2000 and 
and seven to 2019, uh, there was this activity-based funding, and that was changed in 2019. Uh, so the idea here was to incentivize uh, other types of, uh, of topics, uh, types of performance, like um, treating more people outside of hospital, uh, getting fewer uh, unnecessary readmissions, uh, increasing the use of uh, digital solutions, and so on. So it's building it into the financing uh, structure in, in that sense and trying to push the regions to, uh, to move in this direction. Of course, the, the downside a little bit is that the regions do not have full control. They need the municipalities in order to, to really uh, achieve these uh, goals of, of fewer admissions and so on. So it's also... The ambition is to push the regions to, to collaborate more closely within these clusters with the municipalities and the GPs, uh, but, but it's, it, the, the tool itself is directed towards the regions. So looking at the performance, uh, so has it gone well? Was it a good idea to do, do the reform? Has the, the Danish healthcare system performed reasonably well after the reform? Well, uh, certainly in terms of the healthcare uh, expenditure control, uh, there's a fairly good track record of, of sort of uh, having a controlled growth linked up to, uh, to the GDP development, except of course for the last years of the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, but, but that was also sort of a political decision to do that, of course. Um, so healthcare expenditures in Denmark are high, but not as high as in, uh, in some of the neighboring countries uh, and higher than, than Ireland. Um, and uh, the track record uh, on a number of sort of key indicators uh, was quite good uh, until COVID at least. Uh, so looking at hospital productivity because of this 2% uh, annual uh, increase, it actually did increase. Uh, so so you, can, you can sort of uh, push in that direction. Cancer mortality was, uh, was reduced uh, over time due to these cancer packages and investments in, in new uh, cancer treatments. And similarly for cardiovascular disease uh, mortality and waiting times were also uh, dropping uh, at least from, from 2007 and until 2018-19-ish. Um, and a lot, of it, a lot of it was due to, uh, to rationalization of, uh, of the hospital sort of production uh, organization. So trying to, to move uh, things that shouldn't be done in hospitals, uh, move them to being done in ambulatory care settings and outside of hospitals. And, uh, and really uh, that, that process has gone quite far in, in all of the Nordic countries, but, but also in Denmark. Uh, and that means the average length of stay in, in hospitals has been shortened uh, dramatically over time, and it's, it's even more now, of course. These are uh, already a bit old. Um, and, uh, of course, the, that, that requires that the municipalities and the GPs are able to, to sort of uh, step in and to deal with patients that are discharged uh, very quickly from hospital. And that has been a lot of the discussion, so how to, how to scale up that capacity at the municipal level and how to get good agreements uh, when people are, are discharged. Um, you can see that development also in terms of spending. So a lot of uh, money is spent on outpatient care in, in Denmark uh, compared to, to inpatient uh, care. And um, in terms of uh, performance, uh, so if you look at avoidable uh, mortality, you can see that uh, we're doing relatively well on the, on the side of, uh, of issues that should be dealt with in the healthcare system. So, so healthcare system performance is relatively good. Um, but uh, then if you look at issues that uh, are related to lifestyle and prevention, then we're doing less, uh, less well. Um, I think Denmark as Ireland has a legacy of, of kind of poor lifestyle, and uh, that, that is reflected in, uh, in, these, uh, in these figures here. Particularly smoking among women, uh, there's a legacy of, of people, uh, women coming, getting out in the labor market and picking up all the bad habits that, uh, that men had at the time. So, so that's, that's an issue. Uh, we did fairly well during COVID, uh, so you can see in terms of the, um, the case, um, case rates that they tended to be lower than in, in many other countries in spite of, of not very strict uh, sort of lockdowns in, in, the, in the Danish case. And, and that's also reflected in the excess mortality, which also tends to be lower than in, in, uh, in many of, uh, of the other countries. Um, <coughs> now. So things were okay up until COVID. We did well during COVID. And then uh, 
we ran into some challenges. And those challenges are particularly related to, uh, to human resources. Uh, so I think that's recognizable in many European countries and Ireland as well. Uh, and the issue here is not so much uh, scaling up the, uh, the uh, capacity for educating new, uh, no, this is particularly for nurses on the, on the left-hand side. So there's a shortage of uh, specialized nervous, ner nurses, in, particularly in anesthesiology and intensive care. Uh, so, and it's not so much an issue of scaling up the capacity of, of uh, training uh, because it's, uh, there are not uh, enough people that, are, that want to go into the nursing profession. So it's a matter of recruiting into the profession and also that many of the experienced uh, nurses have left. Uh, they've gone to the private sector or temporary companies or into uh, the primary uh, care sector, so gone to GPs and municipalities and, and so on. And that really creates problems at the hospital and uh, the, ho the problems are reflected on the right-hand side, which is the waiting times, uh, because a lot of uh, the elective surgeries cannot take place uh, at the same rate as before, uh, because there's this shortage of, of staff. So, so that has to be dealt with, and one immediate sort of policy uh, reaction was to uh, change this diagnosis guarantee uh, that I mentioned before, so extending it from one month to two months, uh, so creating a bit more space to, to deal with things. But that, that's also a reduction in rights, uh, and, and that's, that's, of course, a bit problematic. Um, the regions are working hard to try to uh, reestablish their capacity, uh, so they are scaling up to the extent that they can. So the dark block in, in, the, in the bottom, and then they're purchasing more services from the private sector. So, so this, uh, this is also a period where the private sector is growing a bit in, in the Danish case. Uh, so they're trying to catch up, but, but they have limitations, uh, particularly due to, to these human resource uh, issues and concerns. So, so what are some of the uh, current reform issues that are going on? Uh, well, of course, a lot of thinking goes into how to deal with these, this uh, human resource issue. And it, it's on the nursing side. It's also in terms of GPs. So we have similar problems that in some of the rural areas, uh, it can be difficult to attract uh, general practitioners. Um, so the government uh, set down a, uh, a committee, uh, and it uh, just came out with its uh, report. And uh, they, a lot of the proposals sort of centered around uh, um, prioritizing better, so, so making sure that, that you do the right things in, in hospitals and also that the, the different staff groups uh, do, uh, are, are used most efficiently, so to speak. Um, but also improving working conditions, um, transfer of tasks be between professional groups, uh, more efficient entry for foreign workers. Uh, we do not have 40% that are educated outside, but we do have some, and, and there's an ambition to maybe attract more from, from Germany or with the Baltic countries and so on. Um, and uh, keeping older staff in work, uh, which is also an issue. Uh, older nurses tend to leave or find uh, more attractive options uh, outside the hospitals. And researchers were included uh, within this committee, so you had both economists and, and organizational uh, theory experts uh, that provided inputs uh, into, into the committee. So far, the, uh, the policy initiatives have been uh, uh, to increase the salaries for nurses um, and increase the number of training slots for GP specialists, uh, so we are scaling up in that front, uh, and quicker access for for foreign staff, so, so streamlining sort of the pipeline of, of, uh, of entry into the country. So, so that, a lot of work is still going on around that and negotiations are going on across the municipalities and the state at the moment. Um, then the other main issue is uh, that um, the, uh, some of the politicians have sort of entered or have uh, voiced uh, the ambition to do a new structural reform. Uh, so they are thinking that maybe the regions aren't the solution in the long run, and it could be a good idea to have either fewer regions, so maybe down to two regions, or just one region covering the, the country, and, and thereby having sort of full control from the, uh, from the state level. Uh, the, the exact sort of... Um, Outline of that is awaiting uh, the outcome of a new structural reform uh, commission, which is working and which is supposed to uh, to issue their report in 2024. Um, 
And some of the key issues that they're looking at would be coordination and strengthening of chronic and local care, uh, but also these structural uh, reforms to, to try to get a, even, an even more sort of efficient match with the ge geography and the demands in, in the longer term. Um, and, and of course, research informs the work in the committee, but as uh, last time with the Structural Reform Committee, uh, it's a balance uh, where sort of the political demands and also the very strict deadlines that they're working within makes it a bit difficult to go out and commission work with, uh, with ex external experts. So, so they have to rely on what's already there to a large extent and sort of quick analysis where they pull in on the statistics uh, from, from different areas. So. Uh, that means we're getting close to the end. Some key points here. Structural reforms uh, are possible, uh, but under certain uh, 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 circumstances. So the political circumstances must be right, both parliamentary and, and in the broader, broader setting with uh, external interest organizations. So internal and external alliances must, must be uh, built. And uh, you need a narrative of the necessity to do the change. And if you can't find the narrative, you, if you can't find the burning platform, then you need to create one uh, as, the, as the structural committee uh, did. And, and you have to sell it, of course, to the municipalities and the regions in our case, uh, so the decentralized level authorities. That's a key issue, otherwise it, it, it won't work in, in practice. Uh, management of the policy process is important. Uh, implementation takes time, uh, takes focus. Uh, so you really uh, you need some of uh, this leverage at the national level in order to push this through. Uh, at least was the experience in the Danish case. And multi-level governance structures are important. So so you need not just sort of a powerful state level, but also mechanisms for uh, for collaborating and and creating a dialogue uh, between the different uh, groups. Um, and research was included uh, in the de deliberations of the Danish reforms and as input to the many decisions that were made along the way. Uh, but uh, in the end, of course, the decisions were, were steered by, by the political side and the administrative side. And sometimes the collaboration wasn't as easy as you might have uh, expected. And uh, yeah, these are some of my students sitting outside. Yeah. <laughs>